In this video, we're going to look at the minimum difference problem. For this problem, you're given a list of numbers and you want to divide these numbers into two different groups such that the difference between the sum of the two groups is at a minimum. You do not need to specify how you divide the numbers into these two groups. You only need to return what the actual value of the minimum difference is. Some constraints are that each number in the list is between 1 and 100 and there will be at most 100 numbers in the list. Let's look at two examples. In our first example, the numbers given are 2, 4, 3, 15, and 9. The minimum possible difference for this example is 1. This is because you can divide these numbers into two groups, one with 2 and 15, and the other with 4, 3, and 9. Just to be clear, we're going to be returning the minimum difference itself, which is 1. So the order of the two groups doesn't really matter. We can think of them as sets rather than lists. For example 2, we're given these numbers. And the best way to divide these particular numbers allows for their minimum difference to be 2. Another thing to note is that the groups don't have to be unique. For example, we could have this second arrangement here, which also has a minimum difference of 2. But the arrangements themselves don't really matter as long as we arrive at the correct minimum difference. So let's explore the thought process and the observations we must make in order to produce a solution to this problem. A good first step for all these problems is to replicate how you would solve this problem as a human and then try to translate it to code. So if I were manually solving this problem, my first step would be to divide the list of numbers into two subsets. Doing that is easy enough. I could just iterate through every single number in the list. For each of those numbers, I can decide if I want it to go into my first group or my second group. So for this example, I have just randomly assigned each number a group. We know we're finished assigning numbers when we've run out of numbers to place in group 1 or group 2. Our next step is to calculate the difference between the sets, and at this point we have calculated the difference for one possible combination of numbers. However, if we just looked at one possible combination of numbers, we obviously don't know if this solution is the best solution. This just means we need to repeat steps 1 and 2 for all possible combinations, and return the smallest difference of those combinations. So for this particular example, eventually we'd find the best solution, which is the grouping that minimizes the difference. So this approach is a good starting point. Let's try and translate it to code. One thing we should pick up on though, is whenever we hear something like all possible ways, all possible combinations, all possible permutations, or something similar, it might be a good idea to consider a recursive solution because we can make use of the recursive branches to permute all the arrangements. The first solution we're going to explore is in fact a recursive solution. Let's start with our function definitions. We're going to need a helper function to make the recursion work. I have called this helper function mRecursiveH, and mRecursive is the function that gets called from main directly. Let's inspect what the parameters in our helper function mean. Nums is just going to be our nums list. I is going to represent the index of the number we're currently deciding is going to go in group 1 or group 2. As our recursion re progresses, we expect i to get larger and larger because once we decide whether a number is going to go into group 1 or 2, we're going to move i over to the next index. In our original call to the helper method, we're going to start i off at 0 because we have not picked any number to go in either of the groups yet. Sum 1 and 2 represent the sum of the chosen numbers in each group so far. Initially, we have not chosen any numbers at all. Therefore, in our original call, both sums start off at 0 because both group 1 and group 2 are empty. Let's handle our recursive cases before the base cases. Remember that when we were discussing the approach, we said that we had two choices. We could either assign the number we're on into group one or group two. I have represented including the number into group one with the first recursive call. In this recursive call, we pass in the same nums list. We pass in i plus one for i. This represents us making a choice for this number. Therefore, the next recursive call, we want the choice to be for the next number. Now since we decided to include this ith number into the first group, we must update the sum of the first group. We do this by adding whatever that ith number is to the current sum of group 1. We leave sum 2 unchanged as putting the number in group 1 means that group 2 will not change from this recursive call to the next. The second recursive call represents us excluding the ith number from group 1 and instead putting it in group 2. Again, we increment i by 1 to represent us making a choice for this number and moving on to the next number. However, this time we add nums of i to sum 2 because we are choosing to put this number into the second group. Therefore, we need to add to sum 2 rather than sum 1. Finally, assuming both these recursive calls accurately give us back the differences, 
we want to return the minimum of those two differences. Now let's look at what our base case is. Our base case occurs when we are finished making recursive calls. And as we discussed earlier, we're finished after assigning all the numbers to either group 1 or group 2. In terms of our algorithm, this happens when i is equal to the length of the list. When we do reach our base case, all we have to do is to compute the difference between the sum of the two groups, however they're arranged, and return that difference. And that's it. That's the recursive solution to the problem. At this point, you could have observed that by using recursion, we're taking care of step 3 in our approach because the recursive branches will explore all possible partitions of group 1 and group 2. Let's analyze the time and space complexity of this solution. Our recursive solution explores all possible ways to partition the numbers into two lists. This means that the running time of this solution is equal to the amount of ways we can partition the numbers into two groups. Let's calculate this. For our first number, we have two choices, group 1 or group 2. For the second number, the same is true. We have two choices, group 1 or group 2. And this pattern continues for every number in num list, we have two possible choices, group 1 or group 2. So basic counting principles dictate that we have therefore have two to the n possible partitions. And therefore, this is one of the drawbacks of our recursive solution. It has exponential running time, which is really slow. For space, we've got to analyze the max depth of the recursive stack calls. This is just equivalent to the amount of numbers in nums, because once we have covered all n numbers, we should reach our base case, so we won't be adding any more depth to our recursive calls. This means our space complexity is O of n. Now that we have gotten a basic solution together, let's try and improve upon it so we no longer have exponential running time. At this point, I recommend you pause the video and try to figure out a different solution with polynomial running time. A hint is that you're going to need to use dynamic programming. So assuming you've attempted to improve the recursive solution, let's look at the solution which uses dynamic programming. For this solution, I think it's a good idea to show all the code and work through an example filling out the dynamic programming table as I explain the code. So if you're a bit lost at the beginning of the explanation, don't worry, just keep watching and hopefully by the end, you'll understand the solution. Before we jump into the code though, let's discuss the subproblems and how you might arrive at a dynamic programming solution if you were asked this in an interview. The first thing is to reword the problem in our mind. Rather than splitting the list into two different groups, let's just focus on a single group. If we focus on one group, let's think of the problem this way. What numbers can I sum to with the various partitions of the first group? Well, we can set a limit on the possible sums. We know that at the very minimum, the smallest sum we can make in the first group is zero. This means that we have no elements in our first group and all the elements go into the second group. On the other hand, the maximum is the sum of the entire list. This would occur if we put all our elements in the first group and none of the elements in the second group. Intuitively then, our best arrangement in most cases is going to be somewhere in the middle. It's the arrangement where the sum of the group 1 is very close to exactly half of the sum of the nums. So how does thinking of this problem in terms of sums allow us to use dynamic programming? Well now, we can word our problem in the following way. We're trying to figure out if we can use the numbers in the list to sum to a certain target. These targets are in the range of values from the minimum possible to the maximum possible. So we would first ask, can I use the numbers to form the target 0? Then we could ask, can I use the numbers to form the target 1? Can I use the numbers to form the target 2? And so on until we reach, can I use the numbers to form the maximum target? If we're asking these types of questions of the form, can I use the first n numbers to form some sum, then we can use subproblems to answer this question. Here's how. Let's more formally phrase our question as, can I use the first n numbers to sum to a target t? Let's pretend that for any possible target, I already know the answer to the following problem. Can I use the first n minus 1 element to form any possible target? Then we can use our knowledge of the n minus 1, which we are pretending to magically know, to answer our current question regarding n. Namely, it boils down to two choices. I do not include the nth element, or I do include the nth element to sum to the target. Let's address the first choice. I do not include the nth element to sum to the target. If we know we aren't going to use the nth element to contribute to the target, then we can reduce our question down to, can I use the first n minus 1 elements to sum to the target? Our second choice is that we do include the nth element in our target. If we are going to include the nth element to sum to our target, then our new question is, can I use the first n minus 1 elements to form our current target minus whatever the nth number is? This is because if we have some target and we're using the nth element in the sum to contribute to that target, 
we need to subtract it off when we're asking our new question because now the first n minus 1 elements should sum to the target minus the nth number, not the target itself. If either of these choices are possible, then we know we can form our main target. Therefore, the answer to the question, can I use the first n elements to sum the t, is the same as can I use the first n minus 1 elements to sum the t, or can I use the first n minus 1 elements to sum the t minus nums of n. Since we only need one of these possible choices to be true, a logical or makes sense here. If what we have discussed so far makes sense, try to pause the video here and code up the solution. If you're still confused, let's jump into the coded solution and a practical example, and hopefully things will begin to make more sense. So here's the solution with dynamic programming. Note that the slash characters in Python allow me to break a long line of code into multiple lines, just so I can fit it in the PowerPoint screen. Now let's look at line by line what the code does. With an example, where the nums list is 2, 3, 2, 1, and 4. The first line of code just calculates the sum of num list. In this case, it is 12. We then initialize our DP table. This table is going to be 1 plus the amount of numbers in the list for the row dimension, and 1 plus the total for the column dimension. For now, we're just going to fill it with null values. Before we move on, let's try and understand our DP table and how it relates to what we were discussing earlier. Let's think of each slot in our DP table as the answer to the following question. Is it true or false that I can use the first numbers in the row and earlier to sum to the value in the column? So the slot DP of 410 would represent the answer to the question, is it true or false that I can use the first four numbers in nums, which are 2, 3, 2, and 1, to sum to 10? You should see that this is false because there's no combination of these numbers that will sum to 10. The slot 3, 5 represents the answer to the question, can I use the first three numbers to sum to 5? You should see that this is true because there does exist a combination of 2 and 3 which sums to 5, namely 2 plus 3. So where does our final answer lie? Well, it's in the last row. The last row represents using all the numbers. For each of the slots in the last row, we are asking can we partition the numbers in the list into group 1 in a particular way that adds up to a target. If the answer is yes, then we need to check if the difference between the two sums is smallest and keep track of the smallest difference. This is what the code in red does. I'll come back to this later to explain it further, so don't worry if you don't understand it now. I just wanted to motivate why we're answering the question in this manner and where our final answer will be. But now that we understand what each slot represents, let's look at the first for loop. The first for loop changes every value in the first column to true. Why should we be doing this? Well, these slots represent the answers to the question, can I use the first n numbers to sum to zero? And this will always be true because you can sum to zero just by omitting all the numbers. Another way of putting it is that we can always pick the empty set to sum to zero. And in a sense, this represents us handling a base case. Our second for loop handles the other base case. It initializes all the values in the first row to false except for the zero zero slot. This makes sense because these slots represents the answers to the questions, can I form some positive integer with the first zeroth numbers? Well, the first zeroth numbers is no numbers at all, and you can't form any target with no numbers except for the target zero. This is why the zero zero slot is true, while all the others in the first row are false. Now let's go through the portion of our code, which will fill in the rest of our DP table. Remember that as we discussed earlier, we can break up the answer to each slot as two subproblems. And this translates almost exactly to our code. The only difference is that we have to be careful and do some bookkeeping because there is the possibility that the inclusion case will go out of bounds. In that case, we can just ignore the inclusion case and we can do this bookkeeping with the if else statement I included, which just checks if we go out of bounds in the inclusion case and handles it accordingly. Now let's trace through the first iterations of this DB table. We start with R being one and C being one. We see that c minus nums of r minus 1 will give us a negative index, so we're going to ignore the inclusion case and jump to the else statement. Since dp of r minus 1 of c, which is dp of 0, 1 is false, then dp of 1, 1 is also false. This operation represents the fact that if we include 2 or exclude the 2, there's no way to use 2 to sum to 1. Now for dp of 1, 2, we see that the inclusion case does not go out of bounds, so we enter the if statement. The inclusion case is true, this is because if we use the 2, we can use 2 to sum to 2. 
the exclusion case is false because if we do not use the two, there is no way we can use the empty set to sum the two. We only need one of the cases to be true to make the overall case be true. Therefore, we can conclude that this slot's overall answer is true. For DP of 1, 3, the inclusion case does not go out of bounds. For the inclusion case, we are using the 2. Therefore, we want to check if we can use the first n minus 1 elements to form the target of 3 minus 2. This is not true as DP of 0, 1 is false. DP of 0, 1 being false makes sense because we cannot use the empty set to sum to the target 1. Now for the exclusion case, we're not using the 2, therefore we want to check if we can use the n minus 1 elements to form the target of 3. This is DP of 0, 3, which is false because we cannot use the empty set to form 3. Since both the inclusion and the exclusion case are false, the overall answer to this question is false. For the rest of the numbers in this row, it should be pretty obvious that they're all going to be false. This is because all the targets are larger than just the first element 2, so there's no way to use just the first element 2 to form targets that are larger than 2. Now we move on to the next row where r is equal to 2. For dp of 2, 1, the inclusion case goes out of bounds, so we'll only consider the exclusion case in the else statement. This represents us using the first n minus 1 numbers to form the sum 1. The first n minus 1 numbers is just the 2, and since we cannot use a single 2 to sum the 1, our overall answer to the main question, whether we can use a 2 and a 3 to sum the 1, is also false. For dp2, 2, again the inclusion case goes out of bounds, so we'll only consider the exclusion case. The exclusion case is that we do not use the 3, therefore we want to look at the slot where we can use the first n minus 1 elements to sum the 2. This is the slot dp1, 2 which is true because we can use the first element 2 to sum to 2. For dp of 2, 3, the inclusion case does not go out of bounds, so we'll consider both the inclusion and the exclusion case. For the inclusion case, we're going to use the nth element, which is 3, to contribute towards our target. This means that our new sub-question is, can we use the first n minus 1 elements to sum to 0? The answer to this is in slot dp of 1, 0, which is true, which makes sense because we can use just a 2 to sum to 0 by just choosing the empty set. For the exclusion case, we omit using the 3, so we're asking if we can use the first n minus 1 elements to sum to 3. The answer to this is in the slot dp of 1, 3, which is false. This makes sense because we can't use just a 2 to sum to 3. We just need one of the two cases to be true, so this slot's overall answer is going to be true. At this point, I'm going to assume that you understand how the mechanism behind the dynamic programming table works. In the interest of time, I'm not going to trace through every single value. Let's just skip ahead to how the table looks after we're finished filling it out. This is how the table looks after the execution of the code which iterates over the DP table. If you want, you can verify that each slot makes sense, but at this point, I'm going to move on to the final section of our code, which we briefly mentioned earlier. In the final section of our code, we're simply identifying which of the sums will give us the minimum possible difference between two sets. For any particular column, the elements which sum to C are in group 1. Therefore, the remaining elements are going to be in group 2, which means group 2's sum is total minus C. Therefore, for any given column, the difference is the absolute value of the difference between these two values. So when we're trying to find the minimum difference, we're going to initialize our diff variable to some arbitrarily large number. This number can be thought of as infinity. We then can iterate through the entire last row. And for each element in the last row, we check if there is some arrangement of all the numbers in nums that can form a particular target C. If this is true, then we calculate the difference between the two groups, group one and group two, and take diff to be the running minimum of the current difference and the difference we just calculated. Finally, all that is left is that when we're finished iterating, we return diff, which will be the minimum difference between the best partition of the two groups. That is all to this solution. Let's analyze the time and space complexity now. For time, the most costly step is filling out the DP table. This takes a total of sum of nums times n, as there are this many slots in our DP table. This is an improvement over the exponential running time of our recursive solution. Our space complexity is equivalent to the amount of slots we need for our dp table. This is O of sums of nums times n as well. There is actually a way to shrink the space complexity to O of sum of nums. That solution utilizes the fact that we only need the information in the current row 
and the one directly above it at any given time. It might be a good exercise to adapt this solution into that solution. But regardless, that is it for this video. I hope you found my explanation helpful, and if you have any further questions, feel free to leave them in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.